I V M. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to ask everyone for a quick favor. We're running a brand survey right now and would really appreciate it if you could let us know what you think about the advertising on IVM. Go to ivmpodcast.com slash survey and do let us know. As part of this, we'll be selecting 10 random participants and sending them some IVM swag. So do fill out those surveys. Here's your smart fact of the day. Apollo 13 was the seventh mission in the Apollo space program and the third meant to land on the moon, but it never did. A routine stir of an oxygen tank ignited damaged a wire insulation inside it, causing an explosion that just completely vented the contents of the oxygen tanks to space. And once that happened, it was left to a bunch of people on Earth to figure out the materials that the people in that craft had and try and guide these people back to Earth based upon them imagining that. In fact, that is the perfect example of group thing being good. So, welcome to Smarter with Sid, the place where we all try to become 1% smarter. Here's the question that I'd like you to kind of reflect upon. Do humans get better, smarter, think better in groups or decisions that are made in groups or do they do that more so individually? Hmm. Well, I think the example of Apollo 13 is the perfect example of when groupthink actually works. Let's look at the factors which made it work. First of all, there was a there was a sense of urgency. Uh, there was also a sense of um, very clear uh, ambiguity. It was the fact that everything was uncertain was very clear, but they also knew the materials that they were working with. And all of them were very, very intelligent. The people in the spacecraft, as well as the people within um, that space station on Earth. And hey, of course, they had luck. But this is not about Apollo 13. This is about, you know, being smarter necessarily doesn't mean just going about in an alone fashion, or it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, having a group sort of think. Sometimes you got to figure out what has to be done when. The concept, in fact, behind Smarter with Sid is actually to figure out how do you make yourself smarter? Can group think make you smarter? Can individual thinking make you smarter? Let's figure out. Now, here's my experience, right? So all the 25 years that I've been working, I've worked in startups, I've worked in industry, and I've worked in academia. Now, There is groupthink everywhere. Don't think that startups don't have groupthink and everyone can, you know, just be individual players or rock stars. No, groupthink exists everywhere. And we need to understand the different shades of 50 shades of groupthink, if you like. Let's look at startups first. When you're in a startup, typically everybody's in growth mode. Everybody's in growth hacking mode and everybody's like hustling. And, you know, all those words that Gary V uses, maybe. Well, you're in a startup and the group think is a very interesting sort of dynamic because everyone who joins a startup typically has that sort of hustle attached to them and people who are not connected to that hustle quickly find themselves either shunted out or they leave the uh, startup very quickly but in a startup i think everybody's aligned from a thinking perspective and that's why it's quite possible that a startup doesn't require too much of you know, meetings or getting together and uh, thinking through and and stuff like that. And actually, it's only when a startup that begins to scale is when people start lamenting to each other saying, hey, we didn't have these many meetings before, not really knowing that those meetings are there for a reason because you've grown beyond, you know, Dunbar's number that is 150. And so therefore, you need the ability to be able to think like a pack because you've kind of gotten people who are divergent from your basic thinking that existed, let's say, a year and a half back. Make sense? Well, that's a startup for you. Then let's look at industry. You know, industry players can be facing different kinds of situations. You can be facing a turnaround type of situation, or you can be facing a uh, sort of uh, just a minor realignment, or maybe you're facing, uh, hey, we are scaling up. We were a startup, but now we're scaling up, whatever. You're an established player. And what's happening with you is your requirement to have Group think. 
So you have meetings and Dilbert has made a lot of fun of those meetings, isn't it? I mean, rather Scott Adams has made a lot of fun of those meetings. Most of them are meaningless. And yes, I will make a separate podcast on the meaninglessness of meetings and how we can make meetings more meaningful and the rest of it. But this is not that one. Right now, we are exploring group think. So how does group think actually happen in established players? You'll be surprised to know that group think happens in a very structured way. There are two parts to it. One is about the meeting and the second is the politics behind the meeting. And I think somebody who is a savvy industry player has to navigate both. A lot of P players actually end up whining and complaining about the meeting. I hope you are not one of them. If you are, please stop. There are better things to do in your life. But the fact is that groupthink exists and groupthink sometimes tends to help people grow in a risk-free sort of way. But a lot of times, groupthink also leads to duller decisions and, you know, less risky decisions need not necessarily mean that they're going to be successful. They just mean that they're dull. And many companies actually try to keep up that startup mode, uh, like Amazon does, says that every day is like the first day. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that a lot of other companies are kind of inspired by that. But the fact is, the more you grow, and I mentioned Dunbar's number earlier, a couple of minutes ago, the more you grow, the more you will find that there are you know, there are divergent people. And that's not a bad thing because you're getting divergent views. And when you're getting divergent views, that means that you have to accommodate different types of thinking and you have to allow different types of thinking to come to the table. Otherwise, what you're ending up doing is you might be, you know, just running yourself into a corner and staying there, right? And it could be very dangerous for you. So the fact is that it perhaps may not necessarily be about too many meetings, but it might be about the wrong kind of people that that organization has. Groupthink can become beneficial if it is actually about the right kind of people. Now, let's look at, you know, academics. If I look at academics, they're pretty interesting because most academics or academic institutions have a certain kind of bias. You know, you have a certain kind of bias towards a certain government or certain system or certain bureaucracy or whatever it is. And I'm not trying to make this political in any way, a lot of academic institutions believe that they should be actually completely uh, unbiased and the rest of it. But we know how human nature is. It doesn't really work. So you are in a situation where wherein academics have a lot of discussions about what needs to be done next, but famously don't end up moving very quickly, do they? And that also is the result of group think. Now, consensus building is an amazing thing. And having been part of great institutions, I've seen consensus building actually help in the execution of uh, an event, right? Uh, Whether it's academic or whether it's industrial. But most of the times, it is also stimming and not really progressing things. So you will not find too much of disruption happening through group think, of course, unless and until all the lunatics are in charge of the asylum. But that normally doesn't happen. In academics, you will find a lot of delays uh, in decision making. But sometimes, and having been part of those meetings, trust me, there is a lot of thinking work that does go in. There is an evolutionary side to all of this. If you figure out, you know, why should we actually try to take decisions in groups? Well, mankind has succeeded because we have hunted as a pack. We've been as a, in a group. We've, you know, survived against predators and the rest of it. So there is a an inherent benefit in groupthink. Now, should you be doing groupthink uh, all the time? Well, I think we discussed that question a little while before. We should not. We should identify And it also depends on your personality. If your personality is that of a disruptor, if your personality is that of uh, a lone thinker, you know, and there is a position for everybody in, in this wonderful, wide, crazy world that we live in. Well, you should be very conscious of what your personality is and does your group think actually work better for you? There are some people who are actually better in meetings. They, they can think things through along with other people. And there are some people who just want to be left alone and do their thing, you know. So group think works when the group works. My suggestion would be to use it consciously as an individual and as part of a team. Be conscious about the fact that what are you trying to meet up as a group for and it will work better. Sometimes there are some kind of decision making and contexts that are ripe for 
group thinking and there are some which are ripe for individual thinking well so is group think beneficial yes it is in the main yes it is but be very conscious of it and also understand what your personality is like i hope you like this episode of smarter with sid from the traveling professor do follow me i'm back on my travels with instagram and linkedin you'll figure out where i am and what i'm doing and if you like podcasts like these well then you should go to ivm podcasts and uh, just download the app or go to wherever you find your favorite podcast from cheers then until next time Hey everybody, let me tell you a little bit about what happened on the IVM Podcast Network this week. We've had some amazing stuff, right? I mean, like I don't know if you're aware of the redoing or the rebranding of the Traveling Professors show. We called it now Smarter with Sid, which is our Deshmukh. This week he examines Netflix getting into e-commerce and will this affect how Amazon's dominating the space? Also, let me give you another quick hitch to join up on. So on Cider Says, Cider was joined by Olympic equestrian Imtiaz Anis. And Nishan Burla from the Triangle Offense podcast showed up on Thursday's Cock and Bull to talk about the NBA Finals. On Nan Kari Sadaf and Arshiv were joined by Keshav Chaturvedi of the Theatre Mere Raste podcast. On Storytellers and Story Sellers, we need to talk to Ashim Mathur from Dolby. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up with what's going on on the network. And with that, let me also just finally thank our sponsors there, what makes things possible. We'd like to thank Seat, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit India, and Lenovo. Thank you so much for making this possible. Come learn and experience the ABCDs of being queer with me, Shunetro, and me, Farhad, on our show, Gay BCD. The two of us take you through our stories and experiences of being gay men in the city of Mumbai and have candid and sometimes downright scandalous conversations about sexuality, gay culture, and everything in between. Catch new episodes of Gay BCD every Tuesday. on the IVM podcast website app or wherever you get all your podcasts from